Major funding for these programs is made possible by grants from Capital One Bank, New York Community Bank, Eastern Consolidated, M&T Bank, Customers Bank, Meridian Capital Group, Terra CRG, The Wickoff Group, Perfect Building Maintenance, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Chase Commercial Mortgage Lending, Genova Burns. Additional support is made possible by AKA Hotels, Corman Communities, AmTrust Title, Aerial Property Advisors, AVR Realty Company, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Leumi USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Citizens Bank, Connect One Bank, Colliers International NYC, Collins Building Services, CPEX Real Estate Services, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, Fisher Brothers, Flushing Bank, Friedman, LLP, Hendler Real Estate Organization, Hersha Hospitality, HAP, Investment Developers, Hodges Ward Elliott, Inc., Investors Bank, I Funding, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Madison Realty Capital, Matone Group, Mercantile Commerce Bank, New Banks, Newmark Grub Knight Frank, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Pulsinelli, Rosewood Realty Services, SJP Properties, Sterling National Bank, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, The Continuum Company, The Knackle Group at Cushman and Wakefield, The Meringoff Family Foundation, The Moynian Group, and These Friends. Italy. Nah, I'm going to travel around the world. San Diego to study English? No, you know, I passed this building in Greenwich Village. One day, maybe I'll go to school over here. Hmm, you know, I'll, I'll become a lawyer. No, I'll be in the military. I'll work for Baker and McKenzie. No, I'm going to come to America. Come to America? I'm going to get my master's. Nah, you know what? I like law, but I really think there's a different area. I'm going to become, get involved with public relations, and I'm going to create a magazine. You know, it's, it's 2001. There's a big need for clothing, quality Italian clothing manufactured in Italy. I'll open up a store. I won't open up a store. I'll open up an empire of stores. I have Dominique Vaca. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. So tell me about your grandparents and tell me about where everybody grew up in Italy. We all grew up in, um, in the south of Italy in a region called Puglia and in a town called Andoia. My grandmother, I, I think about her a lot because she, was, she had a fashion company already. In the what do you mean by a fashion company? This is the early 20s, you know? Yeah, she started in the early 20s and kept going until the 70s. And... Um, she had 50 ladies working for her, seamstresses, making beautiful women clothes, so dresses, uh, gowns in, in Andoya. And um, uh, it's funny because she determined two things in my life. The first thing was she told me, don't do anything related to fashion because it's going to be a lot of work and you're not going to make a lot of money. And that was before fashion was global. So I listened to her and I decided to become a lawyer. Many years later, when uh, I decided to do something that I was passionate about instead of having a job or doing a profession, I went back to think about her and I said, you know, I really love fashion and I think it's in my blood. So I have this passion and I want to do that. So, so, so that was grandma. She worked okay. on both sides. So, so grandma had that effect. Let's talk about Grandpa. My grandfather was also a very creative guy. He had um, a factory and they were making uh, pottery or, uh, you know, uh, uh, 
ceramic plates and, and this uh, is bases. on your mother's side, correct? This is my mother's side, yes. Right. So they were. So your grandfather was uh, an industrial person, yeah. uh, making ceramics, and yeah. also. And your grandmother was selling the dresses where in Italy. In Italy, in the in Andria, in the in the south of Italy, she was making everything from, you know, from the pattern, the cut, the sewing, the design of the dresses. She was literally. A designer and then they made the dresses and they would sell it to whoever wanted. So now let's go to your father's side. Tell me about them. The, your father's side was more of the farmers. And the yeah, my father was um, in agriculture, was a, a farmer and they were in a city in a town called Bitonto that is not far from Andoya and not far from Bari, that Bari is the main city in Puglia. And um, my grandmother from my father's side was um, uh, and was a housewife, taking care of the kids, and, um, and my father was taking care of the land. Now, how did your mother meet your dad? They met strangely. They met in Milan. They were not in uh, Bari. No, not in Bari. I mean, they they came from there. You know, as now, um, you know, even at that time, um, somebody had to move to the north of Italy to look for, you know, a, an opportunity and. Uh, my father decided to go to Milan and uh, actually um, go visit his uncle. There was a lawyer in Milan, so he he worked at his uh, uncle office for a little bit. And then my mother was uh, working uh, f at the time, started working for the L department. Now you said to me your dad was a professor at the college. Yes. So he and came. specialized in Italian literature, correct? Yeah, correct. So then they both came back. And they got married, and they had um, my brother, four years older than me, and then um, they stayed in Andrea all their lives, and uh, had an amazing now, marriage. Now, when we were saying, you, you know, your mother worked for the health department, which was, you know, with socialized medicine over there, which was an important role, but grandma didn't want her to work in the apparel business. Yeah. My grandmother was a kind of an entrepreneur at that, yeah, that time. So she would work as much hours would take. And um, I guess the, the, the better life would be to just have a job that you do from... Guarantee. Without, a guarantee without, job without. that you do from 8 o'clock in the morning until uh, you know, 1 o'clock uh, lunchtime, and then you go back for another couple of hours in the afternoon. So it was a more... Steady. But she worked for the government. She yeah, was a absolutely. civil servant. She absolutely. worked for the government, but she was in a high position with the government. Yeah. And your dad also you know, worked in a way for the government because he worked for the university. Absolutely. They were both you know, working for, for the state. For the, you know, and uh, so it was a secure job and uh, a little bit more relaxed than being an entrepreneur. You, you really enjoyed your, your life as a kid. You, you played piano? Yes. How did you get involved <laughs> with the piano? My parents were great. They they gave me and my brother everything we really wanted, and definitely, you know, parents have this idea of giving the kids a better life than they had. So they would really, you know, I, I was passionate. I loved piano. Every time there was somebody playing piano on on a on a record on TV, I was and you, almost and you, started, and started you loved crying. Playing tennis also, you said. Yes. So we had this very. Uh, already interesting education so i started playing piano when i was five years old i started playing tennis when i was six years old and um, i went to you know train um, as a tennis player in the north of italy every summer and then they sent me to london to learn english so there was um, a great so you education had the cosmopolitan then you said to me that you went to san diego to study one summer correct yes so when I was around 20, I wanted to, perf you know, to work on my English. And since I was doing that in the summer, because that was the, you know, the, the vacation time, I decided, okay, I want to go to the United States. I want to go in a place where I can still go to the beach just you know, a, a little bit. And I was fascinated by the West Coast. You know, as an Italian, you're fascinated by California and New York. Those are the two things so that you look at. the story about New York, about... The, you know your, your visit to New, to New York and NYU because it had it has an effect on your life later on. Yeah, it, it was really interesting because, it, of course, I, as soon as I could, one of my best vacations were in New York. So I came here and the first time 
I came uh, in vacation and uh, on vacation and uh, you know New York was fascinating and I was walking into the village in Washington Park and I saw this beautiful building called you know Vanderbilt uh, building and um, Vanderbilt Hall the Vanderbilt yeah. Hall where is the the school of law at NYU and I passed by and I stopped by and I said this is a beautiful building I like the park this is great right in the middle of New York and I read you know New York University School of Law and at that time, I had no idea that I was going, you know, that I was no interest on, was not in my mind to go to law school. But I said, you know, I would love to study in this building one day. And then I completely forgot about it. Now, you go back to Italy. Now, where did you go to college in Italy originally? I go to Bari, at the University of Bari, in, near my hometown. In Italy, it's different. You go to college where you get your degree and you're, under, you're graduate and undergraduate, and you went for law. Yes. Now, how do you decide to be a lawyer? Your father was a professor of uh, uh, Italian literature, and mom was the health department, and grandma was in the, uh, <laughs> you know, we had the farmer, and we yeah. had the, uh, the apparel manufacturer. See, I think that at that time I had already the idea that, so we were saying, take your law degree. If you don't know yet what you want to do, at least you have a law degree. At least get a law degree. At least you get a law degree. And my brother, took it before me because it was four years old. He was finishing up. And, uh, and then I said, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. You know? So you finish, you get your law degree, and then you go into the military, right? Yes, because the military service in Italy was mandatory. And when you do it, when, when you have already a degree, in this case a law degree, you can do it in a special corp called Guardia di Finanza, that is kind of the military uh, uh, part of the IRS in Italy. So um, I was fortunate to do the test, to pass the exam, so I, they only take 200 people a year, so I did it that way. So how long were you in the military? 15 months. And you were involved with the IRS or the taxation division? Yeah, and it was great because it was a great way to do the military service because the alternative would just be... You would have been a real soldier. Yes, yeah, suffer and hang out for 12 months instead of... So where were you stationed during that 15 months? I was in Bergamo at the academy in the north of Italy for four months for training. And then I was between Cuneo, that is near Turin in the northeast of Italy, in the, in the northwest of Italy and uh, in Milan. So you finished the military and how do you end up in getting a job with this world-renowned law firm called Baker and McKenzie in Italy? I wanted to you know, use my law degree at that point and also... Where, where was their office physically? Was it was in Milan. Milan. Was in Milan. They had an office in so Milan. So you had to leave Bari. Oh yeah, that, that's, that was already a decision I made a few years earlier than that. The idea was you graduated and then then you move on. And then you move on. It was really interesting at the time. You know, I, I knew I didn't want to just do law in Italy. You know, I, I wanted to travel. I wanted to really go around as I did. And um, so I wanted to do international law. I wanted to do something more uh, interesting. So I selected, there was a magazine at the time that published the list of the best law firms in Italy divided by you know, what they were doing. And then there was international law, Baker McKenzie, law firm from Chicago, largest law firm in the world. I sent my resume to them among, you know, to other law firms. And um, I did my interview and they, and they hired me. And it was the only law firm at that time that actually was paying associate because at the time I didn't have the bar exam in Italy yet because you have to practice two years before you can take, be, it, right? you take, and take it. So all the other law firm would make you work for free. Right, you were like the, so the intern, like, the unpaid intern. Exactly. So Baker McKenzie was great, you know, was great experience, great clients, great training. Now, you said to me you did international law for Baker McKenzie. What type of work was it? But we were representing, we were mainly, um, we were representing foreign uh, f companies, foreign firms doing business in Italy. Uh, for example, my first legal opinion was in taxation and was for Levi's, you know, the denim company. They were expanding their presence in Italy and Europe, so there were a number of issue issues or advices to give them while they were setting up their, you know, their, their business uh, in Italy. So that was my first so legal opinion. So we were doing something like that, and then we, I moved to 
also work on mergers and acquisitions because some foreign companies were buying Italian companies. So then after two years, you take the bar? After two years, I take the bar. I stay for four years in Milan, and then I win um, an internship, a scholarship. So how how that happen? That was great because it really gave me the opportunity to, you know, cross the ocean. Uh, Baker McKenzie um, has three scholarships for three associates every year. So you have to be presented by you know the partners in your now the scholarship office. is to go for your master for your master degree abroad, any place you decide, and they will they will they pay for your tuition. That was substantial. They, they, they pay for your tuition and your living expenses. Also? No, just for the tuition, and that was already great. So, I won one of the three scholarship that year, and applied to NYU to this building called this Vanderbilt, building. called Vanderbilt Hall. Exactly, and um, I got in, and then here I am in front of that building, starting my master's degree, my LLM. What, what year is this? 1990. So it's 1990, you come to Baker McKenzie in New York, working, not really working because you're, you're studying, but you're, you have an affiliation with the New York office of yes. Baker McKenzie on Third Avenue, and you're going for your master's in law, in corporate law, correct? Correct. In corporate law. So this is 1990. So after 1990, you're supposed to go back to Italy, right? Yes. So the, 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 the plan was after the, the your master's degree, you go back to Milan. And right, because they paid for this education. Yeah. This, is, this was part of the return. Exactly. And, um, but then I find out that they had another program called um, um, uh, Associate Training Program Abroad. So you could stay actually for 18 months to work for another office of Baker and McKenzie. And Could have gone to Chicago. Yeah, but... Uh, you, you felt it was I a ended little up too cold. It was a little too cold, a little too windy, and New York really you know, is the city that I, I always loved and I still love. So now, I, I, I was able to get in in the New York office of Baker McKenzie. Now, where were you living at this time? Is this Madison Avenue in 67? Between 68 and 69. How'd you find the apartment there? To a friend, uh, a friend of mine was living there. She was moving out, and I, I uh, yeah, so I, I moved so, in. So here's the the guy who who has been able to uh, uh, create a scholarship for himself, get his master's from a wonderful school, and work now on a work study program. So what were you doing at Baker McKenzie in New York? I was uh, see when you do a program like that, the, the, your goal is to create. You know, a link, cross border. a cross border between the New York office in this case and the Milan and the Rome office, the two Italian offices, and develop relationship between the partners and the clients. And then 18 months later, you go back to Milan and now you know the face of the people on the other side of the ocean. So you can keep developing clients between the two countries and the two offices. Um, I had an idea to stay longer than 18 months. <laughs> And I understood, I guess, the New York way that if you want to stay in a place, you have to generate revenues. So what I did was really to be very active in searching for clients, looking for clients. But you couldn't build the clients because you didn't have the bar law degree. The, you didn't have passed the bar in America. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So the point was. So you were more uh, as a one foreign would say, consultant, a consultant, and a business development. Yeah, doctor. a legal foreign consultant. Meaning I was able to give all the advices on Italian law for the American clients in the New York office, of course. And, uh, but for the Italians coming here, I had to work with a team of lawyers at Baker McKenzie. Now, and that was the reason why everybody was, loved me there, because now I was generating work for them. You were generating business and not, you weren't charging it to your, uh, to, to your profit formula. Pretty so, much, exactly. so you were wonderful. You know, you, I were, was, you were producing business for them without taking overhead from them. Exactly. Now, so who were your clients during the period of time when you were at Baker McKenzie, New York? A lot of uh, fashion companies, of course, because Italy was about fashion. So we went from Todd's, you know, Diego della Valle, uh, to... Uh, Zegna, to Versace, to Malo, to Jenny, to the Italian Trade Commission, to the um, uh, REI, the Italian TV channel, that had an office here. And you know, also the Italian Trade Commission was a big operation at the time in the uh, United States and in New York. So mainly 
where Italian companies doing business in the United States, establishing the business in the United States and making their business grow in the United States. At that time, I really was there when the new wave of Made in Italy developed. You know, before the Italian companies used to only sell to department stores, most of them would change their labels and just sell it under their private label. This was the the first time that the brands really came, they opened their offices. So the Zegna and, and the Brioni yeah. and the others. And again, Tots, for example, when we when we started, was me as you know, lawyer and business uh, consultant for them, and uh, another two people, and that's it. And now is so they do more than one hundred million dollars. So, so your eighteen months extended for how long of a period? I went up to six years before I left Baker McKenzie. So it's six years, and this is, so now we're at like 1997, correct? Yeah, pretty much. So what does the lawyer know about public relations, even though he's done a lot of public relations and the magazine business? What happens? Uh, what happens was uh, that I saw that Made in Italy was going to be a very important element for the Italian products to be sold in the United States. Made in China was getting stronger and made in any other country was getting stronger. And we had to develop an identity that was on the quality of the products. So through my conversation with my clients, they were always expressing the fact that, you know, it's a, it's a great market. But nobody States, understands it. But nobody understands us. It's very tough to make Americans understand quality, style, you know, a lot of this. And... Uh, and now that they were not going to the department stores that every time were modifying the products for America, and now they were going directly to the consumer, that becomes more and more and more difficult for them. So they need to communicate in the right way. But you had never really done a magazine. I just had a brilliant idea, I think, at the time, and, and was, why don't we put together a publication... Called Italia. Called Italia, and it's Italy. Uh, monthly publications, glossy coffee table book, very nice. And uh, we create a magazine that talks about the best of Italy. So it was great. We would, you know, it was like 200 pages every, every month. And you also had a public relations firm. That came a little bit later. So while I was at Baker McKenzie, I was literally from 9 o'clock in the morning and 9 o'clock at night at Baker McKenzie, and then 9 o'clock at night, 3 o'clock in the morning, at the, at the office of the magazine, making sure that everything's fine. Of course, I hired people that knew more than me of publishing, and uh, I was able to put together all the other pieces. And, um, and, uh, and then something happened, and that's, this is the switch from whatever I did before to fashion and develop so a brand and a fashion the switch? house. The switch was um, my father. My father, there was, you know, by the way, one of the best dressed, I think, in the south of Italy, and one of the inspirations of my men's collection still now, got uh, sick of cancer. Right, and that's when you went back for yeah, a year. He had lung cancer, so I went back because I'd been living in the United States for a long time. They were coming, visiting two, three times. I would go to Italy a couple of times a year, but I missed a lot of the, you know, the time that um, I wanted to spend with, uh, with, with my mother and, uh, and father. So when my father got sick, I went back to Italy. I stayed with him for six months. Then I came back, and then I went back, and then he passed away, and then uh, something happened. And my point was, you know, really, we live only once, was the first moment that I realized that. And then I said, okay, from now on, I really want to do something that I love. And um, so I quit Baker McKenzie. I said, you know, 10 and years. that's when you went. So it's now 2001. You decide that... The magazine is en enough, the PR is enough. How do you decide to create a, a fashion company? I think it was, it was exposed, you know, it was really one day I was... It was predestined from your grandmother. The exactly. Profession. See, and there, there was a, a moment at the time that I really started saying, okay, great, you know, I quit Baker McKenzie, the magazine is doing well. Next to the magazine, I started a public relations firms for the Italian clients that couldn't find a, a PR firm that was speaking their languages. So, and then I said, okay, I really love fashion. I've been always, you know, excited about clothes. And, uh, and then I said, okay, my grandmother was in fashion. I did all the f 
business part of fashion of Baker McKenzie representing these great companies. Then with the magazine, I learned how to communicate that and I visited every single company in Italy in any, you know, from fashion to jewelry to design to food. And then now the public relation part. So now all of a sudden I said, I have, I think I have everything I need to start my fashion company, my brand. But this was 2001. Yes. The internet bubble had, had bursted. Yes. And you find this 800 square foot store next to Cipriani. Yes. Uh, on Fifth Avenue. Exactly. And, and you meet Jerome yes. Fisher and he says to you, uh, kid, are you out of your mind to go into the fashion business? Yes, pretty much. I, you know, I, I find this great store, 800 square feet. I was negotiating the, the contract uh, before 9-11. And, and then 9-11 happens. And my point was, you know, I want to really do something now. For, it's my passion. I want to relax a little bit and, and, and do something that I like. So perfect 800 square feet store on Fifth Avenue next to Cipriani between 59 and 60. It was fantastic. And then 9-11 happens. And now I start having doubts. And then I'm having dinner with Jerome Fisher that owns, he owns West. Nine West. So 2,500 stores in the country. And he says, are you sure? I don't think you're going to do well in that location. Why you want to go to the fashion business? And then I said, you know what? I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll try to, to, make, now you to said, make it happen. You said at the beginning you had no name on the store. Yeah, so right now after 9-11, now I have the lease on the door. The, you know, the landlord calls and says, what do you want to do? If you want to not do it anymore, we understand. It's, nine, you know, it's after 9-11. So I negotiated a little bit more of the lease and I said, you know what? I'll do it. So now I open, and the Cranes New York was wrote an article and said, not everything is lost in New York. There are still people that, have, that open luxury stores on Fifth Avenue. <laughs> so I opened the store, and uh, I was not sure about my, use my name at the time. So for three, four months, we had no name on the door. And everybody was walking in. I said, this is beautiful. It's very Italian. I like the clothes. You know, what's the name of the store? I said, we don't know it yet. So then over the next 14 years, you open up uh, other stores on Madison, Soho, Qatar, Beverly Miami, Hills, Beverly Hills. M Milan, and so on. Yeah. Then what happens about a year ago about the, the flagship store? Right what now? happens a year ago was that the stores that uh, we had in New York, the lease was running, you know, was running out after we were almost at the 15 uh, years mark. And um, there was a store in Madison Avenue and one on Fifth Avenue. And before that, we had also another store in Seoul a few years ago. So my idea was to put everything under one roof. Which is the flagship store today yes. on 55th Street. And right now we're on 55th Street between 5th and 6th. It's a 10-story building that is a flagship store for the brand. My idea was, while 14 years ago, the challenge in fashion in the United States and in the world was about the fit, the style, the quality, you know, how to dress more European, more Italian, to change the look of, uh, of the way Americans were, were uh, dressing. Today, I think that the future is about creating an experience in fashion retail. And there's no question, there's a definite experience, I've been there. Tell me about your fiance. She's a lovely uh, woman. She's from Italy. She's an actress and, and a singer and a model. She comes from Foligno. That is Her name is? Uh, Eleonora. So as one would say, you know, it was fortuitous that you, uh, you came to New York originally and you saw that building of Vanderbilt Hall. You, you've made a mark and um, you will continue to make a mark. And thank you for being here today. Thank you so much for having me.